Well, good morning. We're excited to uh, have the opportunity to share, and we don't take it lightly that today I'm standing in the pulpit of Pastor Josh Hall. Uh, he's an incredible man of God. Do you agree? I love our son. Uh, I want to just welcome everybody that's watching online. Thank you for taking time to tune in. And uh, as our custom is, we're going to take time to just continue on in worship. And that is in our giving. <clears throat> you know, I was raised in a Christian home. And one of the things that, that was a big takeaway for us is bringing the Lord's tithe in our offering. And Sheree and I have been together 49 years. And uh, yeah, but one of the great things that has happened is all our life together, we've been tithers. We've been givers. And you cannot outgive God. It's impossible. So the QR code is up on the screen, and there's many ways to give. And so we're just going to pray over the offering, and I am ready. I know that this is the uh, rowdiest service at Ocean Church, so ready to minister the word. But let's pray over the offering, and then uh, we'll, we'll get into the, to the service. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your word that never fails. You're always on time. And uh, your blessing, Lord, is being poured out upon your house, your people. And we're so grateful for that. And that we have a privilege, the honor of sowing into the kingdom of God. And, and knowing that, Lord, we can't outgive you. You bless us. And we consecrate this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Well, please stand up with me. One of the great things that we've stepped into is a series that Pastor Phil has led the charge on. And that is a good name. And so I have, it'll be on the screen, I believe. Proverbs 22, 1, let me just read it. A good name is to be chosen rather than riches, loving favor rather than silver and gold. Amen. Can you give the Lord a good praise as we get ready to jump into his word? You could be seated. You know, today is, uh, as you know, is Father's Day. And so I want to just share today a message, and if you're taking notes, the title of today's message is Legacy, the Abraham Isaac Jacob Principle. And having been in ministry for a good number of years, one of the concerns that we have watched over the years is what happens when a grandfather or a patriarch of the family serves God and the son or daughter serves God, but then it trickles down and because we have this kind of almost expectation and we assume that because we're saved or our kids are saved that our grandkids are going to be saved. They're in the house. They know all the lingo. They know the songs. They raise their hands. But that does not mean that they have been born again. And so we've seen a lot of kids that have gone off to college or they get in a, in a school or an environment that really crashes and burns their life and they become a prodigal or they're not even born again. And we, we wonder what happened. Well, every person has to come to a divine personal encounter with the living God. So, you know, Sheree and I met in high school, uh, 1973, and they're going to put a little picture up here. And, you know, we had a, now you know where Josh got his hair. Uh, that's 1973. We're 17 and 18 years old. And when we met, um, we, of course, fell crazy in love with each other. And as we've walked through life together, we have three children. Uh, Josh is our oldest son, and Hannah is our daughter. And then Timothy is our youngest son, and the ages are 42, uh, 44, 42, and 40 currently. And out of that crew, we have 15 grandchildren. And so Josh, as you know, Pastor Josh and Anna have six and our daughter, Hannah, has six girls, and they range from 21 to a year and a half. That's a, that's a big span. And then our youngest son, he's just the slacker. He only has three. We don't know what happened there, so no, just teasing. But he has two boys and a daughter. And we're, we're just so thankful that over the years that God has been faithful to us. And, you know, as we walk through life, there are people that impact and influence our lives. And I think if, if you just pause for a minute and you think about who are the heroes in your life, who has impacted your life, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a preacher 
although preachers impact our lives. We've had people that are sports figures. We've had uh, those that are in the academic realm, the, the uh, uh, medicine realm to really impact our lives. But Dr. Lester Summerall uh, was a great man of God. He was our pastor in South Bend, Indiana, and just incredible man of God. Uh, my father died when I was 19, and Cherie's dad, uh, I called him Mr. I, Bob Ennis, uh, he pastored till he was 80 years old and literally stepped into my life in such a phenomenal way to not only mentor, but bring correction and help and uh, encouragement. And of course, I had the opportunity in ministry to co-labor with him. But we've, we've had people that have impacted our life. But, but what about the bad influences? Because sometimes in our life, we have good, the bad, the ugly, and maybe even the demon possessed that we look at and we go, what in the world happened here? And that would describe my growing up. I was in church. My dad was the who's who of the church that we attended, but that's when he was in the building. Away from the building, he was a completely different individual. He was a womanizer. He was very violent, very narcissistic. Uh, you know, as the oldest son, I took the brunt of most of the abuse. And so growing up, you know, it was in churches one way, away from churches a different way. Well, that impacted my life in a negative way because I, I, I related those two examples. Well, that's got to be how God is. If God's upset at you, you do something wrong, that he's out to smack you, and et cetera. Well, that's not the grace of God. And that definitely is not our loving heavenly father. Amen? Yeah. Just not at all. But that's how things impact our lives. So we're going to look this today, as I said earlier, at uh, really what is legacy? Legacy is a handoff of our character, patterns of behavior, our reputation. Uh, you know, if you have a reputation, you've got older brothers or sisters that are in school before you, and you get in school, and, and when a teacher, you say, oh, you know, oh, good Lord, the hall boys are here again. That's not a good reputation. Amen. But if a teacher goes, oh, I had your brother, I had your sister, awesome, we're so glad you're in, in class, and hopefully you live up to that. But when we think about legacy, the point number one I want us to just lean into is the patriarch. Abraham was a patriarch, and he had two things happen. One, he had a divine encounter with God, and he had divine revelation. And we see that as a building process from Genesis chapter 12. And I want to read to you, there's, there's seven things that happen when God comes to Abram and he says to him, I want you to get up and leave the land of your father, leave Ur of the Chaldeans, and I'm going to bring you to a land that you don't know about yet. And I want you to follow me. But here are seven things that are going to happen in your obedience. Number one is, I will make you a great nation. Number two, I will bless you and make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And those are listed for us in Genesis chapter 12. But as we follow this relationship that God has now initiated with Abram, he starts off and he begins to communicate to him and something happens that, that begins a pattern with Abram's life. Every place that he stops in his journey that God is leading him on, every time he stops, he builds an altar and he calls upon the name of the Lord. There's something that changes. He, he leaves an area and he has a brand new set of values, a, a, a God that he's serving. And, and every time he stops, he builds an altar, he puts a sacrifice on the altar, and he calls upon the name of the Lord. Now he's 75 years old, and God begins to speak to him in Genesis chapter 15 and Genesis 16 and 17. And in the, in the dialogue, God begins to talk to him and, and begins to describe to him that, you know, he, he's going to make him a father of a multitude. And he, and he has a barren wife, and he's, he, he, has, he has infertility issues. He's 75 years old, and he goes, I don't know how that's going to happen, but I, but I believe you. And, and so there's some, you know, he's talking to God. He said, well, do I, make, do I make my servant my heir? Is he the one? And God says, nope. 
It's going to come out of your loins. And your wife is going to bear a child. And, and I'm going to reveal myself to you in a, in a supernatural, powerful way. And I'm going to be El Shaddai to you. I'm going to be the God that is more, help me, than enough. He said, but I'm, I'm not just going to be El Shaddai to you. I'm, I'm revealing myself to you, Abraham, as Jehovah. And, and Jehovah, the term Jehovah, the name Jehovah means the self-existent God who reveals himself. And why is that significant? Because Jesus exemplified the revealing of the names of God in healer, shepherd, peace, every name that is a character-driven, character-oriented name of God, Jesus came along and he represented those names. Amen? In John 14, when he was asked, we just want to see the Father. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I'm a mirrored expression of the Father in nature and character. You want to know how God functions and how he operates? Just watch me. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He ministered to people. He didn't go around hurting people. He raised people up and he loved them to life. Amen? That's who Jesus was, and that's who Jesus is today. So we see this continual uh, revelation, and, and at one point, God says to Abram, Abram, come, come out of your tent. I want, you to I want you to see something. So he brings him outside. See all those stars, Abraham? Yes, yes, Jehovah, I do. He said, well, that's how your seed's going to be. The scripture says that Abraham believed God, and it was laid up to his account as righteousness. And then God takes him out and says, see all the sand? Yes, God, I see that. He said, that's how your seed's going to be. Amen. And the journey between 75 years old and 100 years old is a long time. And we know that there were some mistakes that were made. Uh, you know, Sarah just keeps saying, I don't know how this is going to work, so why don't you just take my handma handmaiden? Her name's Hagar. She may not be as beautiful as me, but the reality is she can bear children. Are you with me? And, and so they, they, they have a child and God goes, that's, that's not the plan. I have a promised child from your loins. And as we see this progression, the, the book of Romans, the fourth chapter, leans in even stronger. And it says that Abraham began to call those things that be not as though they are. He began to call himself Abraham. He began to call himself the father of a multitude. And he began to believe God. And the scripture says that he did not consider his own body dead, nor the deadness of Sarah's womb. But he received the promise of God and he was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Amen? He said, well, okay, how did all this happen? Listen, you don't have babies in an immaculate way, only one. The immaculate conception of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here you got a hundred-year-old guy and a woman whose womb is dead and you can just imagine in the tent at night. Come here, sweetheart. I'm the papa. <laughs> oh, did I say that in church? I'm sorry. The reality is that God had a promise that he gave that would come through Abraham and Sarah, and God brought a promised child, and his name is Isaac. And what we find in this journey is that God not only had confidence in Abraham, but it said, I have known him because I know that he will do what is just and righteous and pass this on. So there's a pattern that began. Well, in the book of uh, Genesis chapter 22, and we're going to segue to the second part of this, and that is the promised son. The promised son has a godly heritage that's now been handed down. Isaac has been born. And in the birth of Isaac, we find that God has not only anointed, but he's asked the, the, uh, the patriarch of the house, Abraham, he said, I want you to take your son and I want you to bring him up on the mountain and I want you to sacrifice him for me. The scripture doesn't say that Abraham prayed and fasted and went to counsel and, and just said, I don't know about this. No, it says he believed God. Say that term with me. He believed God. 
And when he did, he had a pattern of the sacrifice, building altars, doing exactly what God told him to do and calling on the name of the Lord. So the day that this time period came, Isaac is with his dad and Abraham tells the servants, the lad and I will return. And they go, they're going up the mountain and Isaac says, uh, Pop, uh, we got the wood, we have the fire, you have the knife, but where's, where's the sacrifice? And notice there's no fear in it because it's a pattern that he had watched his dad consistently, systematically do. So they, they continue up and Abraham says to his son, uh, Isaac, God himself, Jehovah, the self-existent God will reveal himself and provide a sacrifice. We know that it's a type of Christ because later on, as Abraham represented the father, he's sacrificing his own son with an understanding that even if he killed him, that God would resurrect him from the dead to the point that Isaac is laid on the altar Abraham raises the knife and God says, Abraham, Abraham, and he stopped him from killing his own son and they looked and there's a ram caught in the thicket and Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides, had provided a sacrifice. Aren't you glad that we have a heavenly father that brought his son as the lamb of God to sacrifice for the sin of the world? Well, we see this progression of relationship continue on as God appears in Genesis chapter 26 he appears to Isaac and he, sa he says this phrase I will be with you and bless you for you and your descendants I will give all of the lands and perform the oath that I swore to Abraham your father so here again we have Abraham has a personal encounter with God and there's a pattern of behavior that happens in Genesis chapter 26 that we find with Isaac that is, has been one of my favorite verses. And that is that it, in uh, Genesis 26, 25, it says that, that Isaac built an altar, he pitched his tent, and he dug a well. You say, what, what does that mean? Well, the priority is, again, he saw in his own dad that Abraham, on a regular basis, built an altar to sacrifice to God, call upon the name of the Lord, and Isaac continually did the same thing every place that he went. He would build an altar, sacrifice, call upon the name of the Lord to perpetuate this, this reputation, this character building. We're going to serve God in our household. We're going to do what is both righteous and right. And in doing that, he established a pattern for his, for his family, Amen. his reputation. And his son, later on, is, is uh, Rebecca uh, comes you know, into the scene and, and we see that, that Esau and Jacob come along. He's already got this pattern. He's got this consistent pattern. And so I would just ask today, no condemnation, no judgment whatsoever, but just to, to challenge every, every person, man, woman, is to look at the patterns that we have in our life. Is, is, this, is this the book that is the most important document that we have in our life? Do we, is our life guided by the principles and, and, and uh, the word where God's word never changes? God is always on time. Isaiah 55 says his word will not return to him empty or void, but it will accomplish what he has sent it to do. What is our pattern? Acts 2.42, the church was built on, on four pillars, the word, prayer, breaking of bread, and fellowship. What are the patterns that we have in our life? Isaac kept those patterns of putting God first, family second. The well represents our occupation. We need all three, but he didn't take the occupation and put it first. One of the downfalls in ministry, and, and I, I, I saw this in the early part of our, of our ministry life, it was so intent on being a successful pastor, building the church, building the church, and, and doing what is both righteous and right. But I remember at one point, uh, you know, Josh would say, you know, Dad, hey, let's, let's play catch. And I was so busy 
that I would come home and I'd say, son, I'm, I'm busy. You know, I'm busy, I'm busy. One day, I came home from work because I was working outside of the, the church and building the church. And Josh was in the front yard with our neighbor. And I had said, I'm too busy, I'm too busy. And one day, he's in the front yard of the neighbor playing catch. And I saw that and I said, hey, Josh, hey, son, will you listen to play catch? He said, nah, dad, I'm busy. wake up and we begin to pre, uh, prioritize God first say it with me God first family second job third amen and if we'll do that God will take care of everything else amen so we see this this pattern of behavior one of the great things about Isaac it was in a recession, a time of famine, and he's ready to go back to Egypt. And God said, no, 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 don't, don't go to Egypt. I'll take care of you. And the scripture says that Isaac sowed in the time of famine and reaped a hundredfold. So I've got some good news in 2022. God's still a God that knows how to take care of your and my life. Amen. Who cares if the gas is whatever? Um, buy a moped. And you'll get there on time. Hey, Amen. Start early. Uh, point number three is the problem child. The problem child is Jacob the deceiver. Pastor Phil touched on this uh, two weeks ago. and talked about Jacob the supplanter and how he grabbed the heel of his brother Esau and how that he used deception. Even his mom assisted him in deception to get the birthright. And we look at that and, and, and you know, part of what we've watched over the years is why is it that you can have a, a grandfather, a dad, a family lineage, and, and it's like all of a sudden we, we see our kids, our grandkids drifting off, and they're not serving God. And what we have assumed is that because they're in the building and they sing the songs that we sing and, and say the things that we say, or they even come to the altar, that we assume that they're born again. And folks, that, that's not necessarily true. They may have the lingo of the church, but every person has to have a personal encounter. And that's what we find here with God in, in Genesis chapter 28. Uh, we already know that Jacob has been a deceiver. He has got the birthright by deception. But in Genesis 28, it says this, it, he, God revealed himself to Jacob as the God of Abraham and Jacob. And in the midst of that declaration, Jacob says, the Lord Jehovah will be my God. He has that divine personal encounter that, that brings him to a place of recognition of the need of a true and living God. Now, the book of Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus is at Caesarea Philippi, and uh, he's asking the disciples, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And the, the dialogue is this, well, we don't know. They, some people think you're a prophet, a teacher, uh, Jeremiah. We, nobody knows. He said, well, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And we know the response was from Peter. And Peter said, well, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And, and, and Jesus said, well, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but my father, which is in heaven, and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church was not built upon Peter. It was built upon the revelation that came out of Peter's mouth. You're the Christ. You are the anointed one. And in that revelation, we find even in the Old Testament that God with a, 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 an encounter brings a revelation and something happens in the heart of Jacob where Jacob says, the Lord is going to be my God. He didn't say the Lord will be the God of Abraham or the Lord will be the God of my dad, Isaac. No, he said, he's my God. Joshua 24, 25 says this with Joshua, as for me and help me, my house, we will serve the Lord. But it starts with me. It doesn't start with the house, it starts with me. And when we make that declaration, I'm going to serve God with everything I have. Luke 14 says that we have to vehemently, above all things, choose Christ. And when we do, we become truly his disciple. Amen. So we look at the revelation, but God's not through with Jacob. 
In Genesis 32, we find the angel of the Lord, which is Jesus himself, and he, and he meets with Jacob at a little windy river called Jabbok. In Jabbok, we have these times in our life, and I don't think it's once, I think it's on a continual basis in our growth with God, that we come to a place where we wrestle with God. We find ourselves alone. Nobody else is around. We have to work through the issues of discipleship and, and decisions and bowing our heart and bowing our knee. You know, I started wrestling when I was in grade school and wrestled all the way through junior high and high school and I wrestled for the U.S. Navy uh, Greco-Roman freestyle team and then I wrestled in college. And, you know, wrestling is, is a individual sport. You may have a team, but you're out there by yourself. And, uh, you know, I specifically, it was one time that I was wrestling in Seattle, Washington, and, and I was just, I was beating this guy from the army, and I was ahead of him, and my sweetheart got so excited, there's three periods, and I was ahead the first period, ahead the second period, and Cherie got so excited, she jumped down out of the stands, ran out on the mat, gave me a kiss, and said, you're doing good, honey. <laughs> and I got beat in the last period because I got so mesmerized by my sweetheart. But I was alone. God wrestled with Jacob. And I, I get this, I have a vivid imagination. I can just imagine, you know, all the moves that were going on and the headlocks and all the other stuff that was taking place. And, and Jacob has got, I don't know, he's probably got, a, got his arm around his leg saying, I'm not gonna let you go till you bless me. You got to bless me. You got to bless me. And, 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 you know, what's your name, by the way? Why do you keep asking about my name? I'm not going to let you go till you bless me. And the Lord said, well, before I bless you, he touched him in the hollow of his thigh, touched him in his flesh, and said, that has to die. Your will, your own plan, your processes have to die to really be in my plan. And he touches us in the hollow of his thigh. And, and we see Jacob now, he's, you know, well, you bless me, but you hurt me. <laughs> and you, knocked, you knocked out my thigh. And he walks with a limp, but that limp is not about pain. That limp is about identity. That our identity is not in who we are. It's not about our plan, our will, our purposes. Our identity is wrapped up. God, what do you have for my life? What do you want for my life? And in that process, he says, I'm going to change your name. And he changes it from deceiver to Israel. That he would now carry the name that a nation carries so that he could perpetuate the blessing and the anointing of Almighty God so that the patterns of behavior, the character, the reputation could be passed down through legacy to say, as for me and my house, we're serving God. What we do is we build altars. What we do, we call upon the name of the Lord. And it's not about a forced behavior. This is about example. This is about living holy and living righteous and living right. I would just say that this, I heard this years ago, but change is inevitable. Growth is optional. Every one of us go through changes. You know, this year I'm 67 years old and I look in the mirror and I don't know where that guy came from. I don't think that way in my brain until I look in the mirror. I think I'm taller than I am until I stand close to somebody that's bigger than I am. I think I have more hair than I do. And then I see a reflection off of a light and I go, some guys parted on the, on the right and some guys parted on the left, but some of us have departing and we're trying to hang on to what we have. There's change. Change is inevitable. What are we going to do with change? Are we going to grow? Or are we going to shrink? Amen? Change isn't change until we change. We need to break patterns of behavior that maybe have plagued our family for a long time. I want to end with this. The last point is the prodigal. We're all familiar with the prodigal son. Really, the story is not about the prodigal son. It's, it, it really is more about the grace-filled heavenly father. 
prodigal went out, took his inheritance, wasted it on riotous living, and he came to himself at a place and he started rehearsing this speech. If I just go home, if I just go home, here I am in a pig pen, if I can just go home, if I just go home, I'll say to my dad, hey, dad, I've really, really messed up. And, and, and I'm not worthy. I'm so ashamed. I'm not even worthy to be your son. But if you just let me live where the servants live, do what the servants do, I, I really messed up out there. But if you just let me come home, I, I, I don't need a title. I don't need a how. I just let me live with the servants. And he's making this speech internally on his way home. All the while that he has been gone and, and making this, you know, a mess of his life, the father, incredible father, is waiting. He's probably looking at his watch saying, ah, it's a, he's, he's running out. I know he's out of money. He's really messed up. But he sees this, this probably the dust coming off of, the, of this young man walking toward the house. And the father looks and he says, that's my boy. I'm going to tell you today, if you've been away from God, if you're a prodigal, the father's like this. He's just waiting. How many of you have prodigals as parents or grandparents? How many of you have prodigals out there you, you believe in God? Come on, raise your hand up real high. God sees your hand, and he knows your need, and he knows how to get to these kids. Amen. And they, they're coming home. Are you with me? But he's waiting, and as this, the closer the son gets, the father runs out to him, and when he gets to him, the son starts rehearsing this speech. He starts rehearsing. And the father's not listening to his speech. The father's barking orders. Kill the fatted calf, get a ring, get sandals, get a robe. Whoo, this boy stinks. Let's get him a bath. My son who was dead has come home. No condemnation, no judgment, not a list. If you're coming back in the house, see, there's the five things that I expect of you. None of the above. The grace-filled, loving to life, heavenly Father is just like that today. And if you've ever been a prodigal, if you've ever been away from God, God is waiting with his arms stretched out. The other side that I want to just briefly share, if you're a father and maybe you haven't had the best patterns Maybe you haven't lived up, lived up to even the standard you felt like you should in your own heart. God is not a God of judgment. He's looking for you and I to simply say, today is a new day. Draw a line. Isaiah 43 says, behold, I will do a new thing, shall you not know it? And God is an expert at forgiving and releasing. All we have to do is be willing to, to repent. He's a big God, and he loves us. Amen. How do we build a legacy? Start. Just start. Just live life, be who you are, personal encounter with God, patterns of behavior that build over a period of time. We all make mistakes. Nobody's perfect. But that's why God is such an incredible Father. He's filled with grace and mercy. When we go to the throne of grace, we will obtain mercy and help in time of need. Amen. Will you stand to your feet with me? If you just bow your head for, for just a moment, I'd like to invite our altar team to come to the front, if you will. My, my, my going to be people up here at the front that are ready to pray for you and stand with you. If you're a parent and you're believing God for your kids to come home or your grandkids to turn, uh, I love the, the scripture in Acts 20 that says this, we commend them to the word of his grace, which is able to keep them. God knows who and how to get to them even better than we do. Amen. He cares more for them than we do. But if you just bow your head for, for just a moment, if, if you're in the house, if you're
you're watching online, you say, man, I, I'm one of those prodigals. I'm, I've been away from God. And today's a day. It's a day to turn and come back to Father's house. If that's you, would you lift your hand up real high? Thank you. Thank you. I see your, hand. I see your hands. Thank you. God bless you. Keep them up for just a minute. Thank you. Thank you. The Lord knows and He loves you. He doesn't hold anything against you. You can put your hand down. He has nothing against you. The only thing He has is mercy and love and forgiveness. If you're in a position as a dad and you're saying, man, I have, I have definitely not lived up to what I should be or should have been, and, and you're feeling condemnation or even shame today or a failure, uh, would you just lift your hand? Nobody's looking around, just me. Okay, thank you. God bless you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Anybody else? You can put your hand right back down. I'm, thank you. Thank you. I see your hands, guys. Thank you for your courage. None of us are perfect. Just start today. You know, and I, I just feel really strong in my heart. It, it may, may mean that you communicate with your kids, even maybe your grandkids, I don't know, that uh, you need to ask for forgiveness. Humility is, is a powerful, powerful tool to bring restoration. Amen. Well, our altar team is here. You can look back up. Our altar team is here to minister. And if you raise your hand in, for any capacity, if you haven't been born again, we, we want to pray with you. And our team is here to, to minister to you. And as I dismiss, just the altar is open. And you can come at any time while our worship team leads. So let me pray over you. Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for your love, your mercy, your compassion. And uh, Lord, I just pray, Lord, uh, as we just looked at the word today, whatever you speak, I know that you're speaking to people. And Lord, we're going to go home, take something away with us today. We bless you, bless your people in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.